welcome to this special episode of Lawyer's Coach. In this edition, Claire Rayson is joined by Miriam Gonzalez Durantes. She's an international trade lawyer at Cohen and Gresser LLP and also the founder and chair of Inspiring Girls, an international charity campaign that connects women role models and girls to raise their aspiration for future career choices. Here's Claire and Miriam. Miriam, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. So we're going to start by asking a question that I ask all of my guests, and that is what inspired you to become a lawyer? Well, I got to be a lawyer almost by chance, I should say by default, because I wasn't thinking about becoming a lawyer initially. I wanted to be a journalist and then uh, a diplomat and a politician. And I I studied um, in my little village um, in the middle of Spain, in Castile. And uh, in the um, school in my village, my mother was a chemistry and physics um, teacher. So I avoided all the sciences, not to be with her in the same (laughs) classroom. And I ended up doing humanities and I didn't know what to do with humanities. And, And at that time in Spain, you know, Girls like me who didn't know what to do, we would do law (laughs) just to have all our options open. And then actually, you know, I continued my career. I ended up doing um, international affairs. I started working in the European Union. So I did many other things that were always related to law, but not really working as a lawyer. And it's only when I moved from Brussels to London that I kind of recycled myself back to um, the lawyer I was and when I started working in, in private practice. And I'm sure you've had many and you've mentioned a few there, but what have been some of your career highlights? Well, I, I have had many things in, in my career that I consider defining moments. For me, when I started working as a trade negotiator in the World Trade Organization on behalf of the European Union, that is something that I... I loved, I really like them. On the legal side, what I like the most is the legal strategy. And, and negotiations are all about strategy. And there is a combination of knowing the legal side and knowing the commercial side and, and putting it all together with different countries. And also a little bit of psychology also of, of trying to see where the negotiators are are going. And, and that, I don't know whether it was a highlight, but it's certainly the bit of my career that I have I have enjoyed uh, the most and I always I'm always an optimist so I always think that the highlight is is yet to come. Oh well I'm sure that I'm certainly when you when you look at your CV you've done so much but one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to you today uh, was about inspiring girls so can you tell me a little bit about why you uh, why you decided to found inspiring girls? Well, Inspiring Girls is an international organization uh, that connects female role models with girls and we show the girls all the many things that women already do and and all the options that are available to them. And when we have them there with us, we also tell them, look, whatever you choose, that is up to you, but try to be the very best (laughs) at whatever whatever you do. And it's, it's based in the UK and we operate already in 20 different countries. And and the reason I ended up doing that is um, basically that I so, you know, I have been focused on gender issues for my whole life. I was born in Spain while the dictatorship was still in in place and the situation of women there was very different to what it is now. And then when I started traveling and working abroad, I saw that the situation of women in other places was actually not so different (laughs) to what I had seen in my in my childhood and something that that worried me a lot is that many girls um, more than 55 percent of girls between 11 and 21 actually uh, say themselves that they feel that they do not have access to female role models and I always thought well this is absolutely absurd because I know so many there are so many amazing women they just don't make it into the magazine and into the TV programs, but they are fantastic role models. So the issue is not to find the role models, is how to connect them with the girls. And at the time, my my husband, Nick Clegg, was in, in government in the UK. I had quite a bit of media attention that I, I didn't really like very much. And at one point, I thought, well, why don't we use this media attention 
for something positive and something that lasts and, and that can really make it a difference. And that is how, how it all started. And I'm, I'm really glad to say that there are so many women helping <laughs> all over the world now that from the moment you put a simple idea on the table, you really don't have to do much to, for it to be successful because it's the energy of all the women behind that, that really makes it work. And you mentioned there, you know, some of the things where you, you, that, you know, the simple idea. Do you think that's the reason behind the, su- the success that you've had? Because I know you've grown and grown and you're in 20 countries now, I believe. Do you think it's just the simplicity of the, of the idea that's, that's what's captured people's imaginations? I think there's three different things, really. One is, is that indeed the idea is very simple. It's about you telling girls whether it is by going back to school, by doing it through digital uh, media, what you do and how you came to be what you are and your ups and your downs. That is really important, by the way, because many girls want to see what is the ladder to become what you are. And look, there is no ladder. (laughs) You you have to learn that you are going to be going up and down and you need to cope with that and to be resilient enough to to do all that. So that that simplicity of everybody can do it and it's not a lot of time and that is how you can help has been crucial for, for our success. I think that the other ingredient is that this is about helping the next generation and, and many women who have been doing gender related issues like myself and many people I know, we have been doing a lot to help each other within our generation and, and I think that we have come to understand that we need to work with girls as young as possible and as early as possible so that we really make a difference on what's, what happens um, next. And I think that the other big component is that what we do is about doing something. So there is a lot of gender-related activity that is about talking about things. And many, many of us, myself, definitely one of those, are getting very frustrated that we keep talking about the things and, and things don't really change. So this is about doing something and making a, a really specific contribution, which is simple to make. That is why it's been successful. I think. And, and also because of the generosity of lots of people, of course. <laughs> well, I, I need to do a video. And, and actually, to that point, if anyone is listening and wants to get involved in Inspiring Girls, what can they do to, to be part of it? Well, it is very simple. Normally, we ask women to give us one hour to go back to schools and to talk to girls. And it's the schools who call the, the volunteers. But now that the schools are really um, under a lot of pressure, uh, we have a really good digital tool that you can self-record a video. It is just a few minutes. In 15 minutes, you are done. You just say what you do and how you started and what is important in your job. And any girl with access to the internet all around the world can watch that and eventually can be in touch uh, via the schools if you are willing to do that. So it's 15 minutes. I, I can promise that it's a really great experience because whenever you try to do something like that and you think about what you have done in your life, we all realize how much we have done. <laughs> it's just, you know, looking backwards, it's, it's always such a good experience in a way. You know? So it's, it's fun, it's helpful, um, and it's very uplifting. And, you know, you mentioned role models there and, and, and you must be a role model to, to, to girls and, 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 you know, our generation as well. When young girls look to you as a role model, what would you like them to know about you? What would you like them to know about your journey and why you are where you are now? Well, I think that we are all role models and I, I keep meeting women who ask, but did you think that girls could be really interested in what I have to say? And I think that we women sometimes underestimate how the only thing that you cannot choose about your life is whether you are a role model or not. You know, that, that depends on whether others <laughs> look up to you or, or, or not. And, um, and we have a responsibility in that sense because there is always somebody else <laughs> looking and thinking, oh, you know, I, how would she have done this? No, which I think that is the key characteristic of a, of a role model. I think that when, when girls look at me, what I I would really like them to see is that I have always made an effort. So I'm sure I have got lots of things wrong, many things in my life that I could have done differently. But every time I have seen an opportunity, I have jumped, sometimes 
without even knowing where I was jumping. And I definitely always have made an effort to make the very best. Sometimes I have made an effort at things that were not really worth it. But, but even with that, I still recommend the girls always, you know, go back to at the end of your day thinking, I have tried. And it, it hasn't worked out, you know, you, you will recover from that. But thinking, I didn't really try enough, that is something that is very difficult to recover from that. Yeah, I think my my mum always instilled that in me when I was younger, and I think it's a lovely message to to carry forward. I want to change tack a little bit because I know that Inspiring Girls focuses on uh, on the younger generations, but I want to think a bit about the legal profession. And uh, you know, I'm looking at kind of the latest SRA survey. Whilst it's encouraging to see that below partner level in England and Wales, fifty nine percent of lawyers are female they still only represent about 34% um, at partner level and it's less than that at, at larger firms. So why is it, do you think, you know, girls are coming into the profession, they're, they're trying, but they're clearly not staying. What do you think um, is the reason why women are still underrepresented at the top? And what do you think needs to change? Well, I think that, that that pyramid structure where there are many more women at the bottom layers than at the top layers is something that is reproduced in lots of different industries. So it's not only in the legal profession. And I think that, that in a way there are other professions where, where we have a huge worry that that uh, pyramid is being reproduced. I, as a lawyer, had always um, been told that part of the reason that we women are not as many at the very top is that we had to catch up. And that's obviously there were men for many, many years, yes, making it to the top and that now we were making it, but, um, but not in sufficiently big numbers, but just wait a little bit and it would happen. When you look, I live now in Silicon Valley. When you look at the tech world, that pyramid is still there. <laughs> and you think that this world didn't exist 20 or in some cases 15 years ago. And nevertheless, we continue having that pyramid. So I think that that argument of, of men have been there forever and therefore it's going to take time is not the explanation as to why that pyramid is there. In my case, and I have been in management roles in law firms, I continue seeing that it is very difficult if you are a woman and, and the, um, the, the time in your life when you start thinking as to whether you are going to have children and, um, and these other aspects of your life, if that coincides when you need to be making that effort to make it to partner, it's a very difficult thing to, to handle. And I have seen associate after associate uh, giving up or just making the calculations as to what they were getting from the job and what the childcare uh, would mean and I'm thinking you know I just I just can't afford something like this so so I continue thinking it's not the only um, it's not the only issue every time that I talk about this I get some people telling me that you're not taking into account the women who do not have children who still face those challenges of course there are lots of different factors but to me, the biggest factor is the, the, the children's years that coincide with, a, with a, a time in the career of those women that make it very difficult because law firms work generally with a very, very traditional structure. You know, I have been very surprised. And I, as I say, I was in management roles and talking about how it is absurd that we ask all the lawyers to be in the offices until whatever it is, 8, 9, 10 p.m. I said, why, why are they here? They can do this with a computer. You know, it was only a couple of years ago that I was having some of those discussions with partners, not only male, by the way, also female partners, and, and, and hearing, but you, we cannot trust them. We, uh, what would they do if they are at home? It's, like, it's unbelievable that you may not trust your workforce, right? Now suddenly we have a pandemic. We need to move everything um, online and it's fine. I mean, some of those law firms are actually making more money than they were making some years ago. So, you know, th those kind of 
old fashioned structures that nobody wants to change. I mean, so, sometimes they need to look at the productivity rather than, you know, their, their very old fashioned mindset. You know? But if we want talent, we need the female talent as well. That is for sure. And the young female talent, of course. And I'm going to talk a bit about stereotypes in that context now, because, you know, I made my decision to to leave a city law firm, actually, interestingly, before I had children, because I decided that, you know, I, the hours were such that actually I couldn't see myself getting to the end because at some point in time there would be competing priorities in my life. Um, and I have four children and every pregnancy I have been asked, are you going part time now? Um, by men and by women and and that's when I realized and and I've lived you know in Chile and I've you know had the same question asked to me in Chile as 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 is in the UK um, and that for me is when I realized that stereotypes ran deep and I think you know um, female stereotypes it's been shown impact the confidence level of women it impacts on the ability of women to talk about certain subjects that are seen as male subjects um, you mentioned tech. I think that, you know, STEM is, is, a, is a, a fantastic example of that. And again, if we think about the example that we've just been talking about with women having to choose to have a family and balance, you know, balance their career with their family. For me, that still looks back to that stereotype of the woman will be the one that will look after the children and it will be the man that will give everything for their career. And those women that make it need to make a choice that is going to be uncomfortable for them. What powerful conversations do you think we need to be having? Or you mentioned, actually, we do a lot of talking. Perhaps we need action. What action do we need to be taking in our firms to stop those stereotypes? Well, we do a lot of work in, in inspiring work, girls around the subject of, of stereotypes. And I'm, I'm very glad to have seen that now. I think that probably because of all those many discussions that many of us are having on stereotypes, even organizations like the OECD, have started focusing on stereotypes and how that impacts the education of, of boys and, and girls. Um, the stereotypes are there from the age of five, six. You know, sometimes we have done panels with little um, girls and boys and we have brought groups of men and women and have asked them, you know, what jobs do you think that these people have? And it's just unbelievable, you know, with the, with the men they talk about banker, they talk about doctor, they talk about boss. They don't really know what kind of boss, but boss nevertheless. With the women tends to be teacher, tends to be nurse. If you bring um, um, a, a young, uh, beautiful uh, woman, it's model. And, and for some weird reason, uh, party organizer that they associate <laughs> with women. Perhaps it's not a, a very bad thing, but you know, it's there, and what happens to those children who are born with nothing, right, in their minds, that by five or six years old, they are already thinking about jobs in terms of female jobs and, and male jobs. What happens to them is us, <laughs> the influence of society. So clearly, if all of us behave in a slightly different way, those children would not be getting those signals. And I, you know... I, I do realize that in the gender discussion that there is quite a lot of um, focus on times about, you know, this is lots of dark forces working in this direction and, and people who want to keep us there doing the same things, uh, women. And I, th I honestly think that sometimes it's because we just don't think in the moment. You know, I have found myself sometimes saying, you know, don't cry like a girl or say like, how come I saying that when I'm so focused on these issues? Right? So a lot of those signals, which are really small, it takes nothing for all of us to think about the impact that they have on the next generation. And there is already a lot that we can do uh, to sort that out. I think nevertheless, that there is a much bigger, much more difficult issue for all of us to think about there, which is the extra burden that women have whether it is in relation to children, that that is happening a little bit less because there is more sharing with men, but definitely in relation to the house. And it's predominantly women who are sorting out all the things that need to be done in the house so that, not just so that the family can do whatever, no, so that society can be productive. So it is a really unfair situation. We have managed to make this 
into a taboo. If you talk about it, it's like if you are whinging. Some of us don't talk about it because we feel embarrassed that we have accepted <laughs> an unbalanced sharing of the tools and, and therefore it's just uncomfortable to talk about that publicly. There are some class connotations because some of this means, so who is going to, to do this? You know, The whole thing has got all together and basically there is something really, really important for society to be productive, which is that we all need to eat proper food. We need to live in hygienic conditions. We have seen this during the pandemic. You know, when we couldn't do that, we couldn't work. <laughs> so, so now what? So how are we going to sort it? We continue just leaving it there. And it's women who do it um, hiddenly. Or, or are we going to open it up and think about how best to organize it and try to, to have a menu a menu of options is perhaps some people need to be helped, perhaps not. I don't know. You know, I don't have the solution, but we definitely need to put the issue on the table. And it's interesting because you mentioned that and um, there are some statistics that did come out over the pandemic period. I'm trying to have got them written down somewhere, but it suggested that um, that over the period of, of COVID, um, whilst time spent with children on developmental childcare so for example reading helping with schoolwork was was more balanced between men and women actually it was women who were spending a lot more time on the non-developmental childcare so the washing the feeding the dressing the supervising childcare so whilst men did take on extra you know responsibilities over this period it has been the 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 women that have picked up most of it and and going back to the traditional stereotypes of you know I'm happy to sit and read with 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 my child but you know almost as you say not even discussing it but you know it it will be the woman that will fall back and do the cleaning etc etc and I think for me one of the things that doesn't get discussed with successful women is the support system that sits behind and I know myself I've always worked and I've got kids I wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for the fact that I now live close to my mum and she helps I have a cleaner and all of that support system kind of doesn't get discussed and I think for COVID what it's done is highlighted that when that support system doesn't exist it does fall yeah. back onto the women. Yeah, completely and by the way that happens um in pretty much every country. So there are some countries where it's really, really bad, like in Mexico, but even in countries like Norway, there continues being a huge imbalance in the amount of hours that women dedicate to those tasks and what men do. And, and, and by the way, we tend to look at this like an issue of balance, but perhaps we need to look at it as an issue of balance and also what other solutions we have. You know, the balance is okay if you look at it like a family, <laughs> but if you look at it like a society, so we do need that to be able to produce. And it is obvious that if somebody can contribute whatever it is to society, which is at higher level than that person being dedicated to cleaning whatever it is, we as a society should have an interest on that <laughs> because that produces more money that pays more taxes, that pays for the roads, for the hospitals, for whatever it is, right? So that economic discussion and that society discussion, we are not having it, but we have a lot of people who could be much more productive. And you know, all our countries have a huge issue in, in Europe in the broader sense, including the UK, in terms of productivity. And, and we are not thinking that there is a lot of productivity untapped there because we have people dedicated hours and hours before they go to their jobs and after they come back from their jobs, dedicated to other things that, that perhaps they don't need to do. But it's, it's, such a, you know, it's such a difficult issue because it comes together with so many class connotations. And, um, and yeah, as you say, I think that lots of people do not feel comfortable about talking about the fact that they have helped. I have found that a lot during my career. You know, I would go to meetings and uh, and we could not talk about uh, whether you had help with childcare. I have all, always you know, spoken openly about the, the fact that, of course, if I'm here at 4 p.m., somebody's with my children <laughs> because I'm not there. But by the way, if you men with me in this meeting, you are here at 4 p.m., it's because somebody is with your children <laughs> as well. No, Perhaps it's your wife, perhaps it's a helper, whatever it is, or an after school, but they are somewhere. No? Mm. 
Yeah, it's interesting. So we're recording this episode just before International Women's Day. And to tie some of the themes together, I just want to think about the UN women's theme this year to honour it, which is women in leadership achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. And to quote um, the UN, the crisis has highlighted both the centrality of the contributions of women, but also the disproportionate burdens that women carry. So I think that kind of really does sing back to what we were talking about. So do you think that COVID and the fact that, you know, the help that perhaps has been hidden, the fact that it's not been there this year in lots of countries has highlighted that this kind of support network exists and that, you know, it is a discussion that needs to be had. I I do think that there is a massive issue there. As I say, I think that we have left it a bit as a taboo. It's it's good that international organisations put a focus um, on it. I have to say, though, that over the years I have got really critical of the contribution of the UN in the gender debate. And and I think it's great that year after year they they put the spotlights on a day that rallies all of us (laughs) into saying, come on, we cannot lose momentum, but there is much, much more than the UN could be doing in the gender debate. I think that that there is a need for ideas, for for ideas that are difficult to generate as as we are discussing at a grassroots level, and they could be getting some of the thinking for uh, around these difficult ideas in terms of what are the solutions, not just highlighting the problems. You know, the, the Secretary General of the UN keeps coming up highlighting the problems. And we want more than highlighting the problems. We want to start thinking about options in the understanding that once that we have whatever, 20 different options, we are going to knock down 19 of them. But if we don't start moving into more practical measures that the countries could be considering, you know, the, the taxation system, for example, how come if I use a car for my job, I can deduct that? But if I need a helper to be with my children, because otherwise I cannot help, that's, you know, <laughs> that the state has nothing to do with that. You know, there, there are some obvious ideas that perhaps are not good, but we need to start considering them. And certainly I think that in the UN, they should be doing much more about the situation of women in some countries that see their human rights violated every single day. You know, if some of the things that are being done to women in some countries were being done on the basis of race, you know, we would have sanctions on some of those countries. It cannot be that in the UN they just sit there accepting that some of those violations of human rights are simply because of cultural reasons without anything happen in this multilateral system, <laughs> trying to, to make the situation for women in those countries change. So, so yes, to all the focus of the UN on International Women's Day, but I want to see more action from the UN, really. And in terms of action, and and obviously Inspiring Girls, you mentioned right at the beginning, is all about action. What other actions have you seen, either through organisations or, you know, examples in specific countries, maybe, that you think have been really powerful? I think that there is a lot of organisations, really. If any woman listening to this is keen to do something, there is, you're spoiled for choice right now. So you can do uh, mentoring, you can do, in terms of the STEM, there are one million initiatives in every single country. What I'm trying to, um, to do is to try to, to generate more of the discussion around the difficult issues, which is where I think that we should be going then. But, you know, there, there are so many different options and so many different organizations and by the way I think that's something that is really good now is that many of us are really helping each other so so a lot of the rivalries in the charities world I think that we are being able to to overcome them no but but in the area where I focus which is the girls there are millions of of initiatives and and when you look at young women there are even more because you have all the civil society ones, but there are also lots that are being done within the companies themselves. That there are some really interesting reflections. You know, some of the big companies, for example, have started thinking, why is it that we do not get enough women into some of these industries? And, and they are they are having the mental, they are doing the mental exercise of thinking, what if we could only recruit women? 
how would we do this so that we get the very best women out there and how would we modify our procedures and it's like okay well now do it <laughs> do it without having to recruit only women so some of some of the thinking right now is really very good and you know if you if you want to help the excuse is not the lack of opportunities i think <laughs> And thinking a little bit, so again, yeah, as I mentioned, I've got four four children, two girls and two boys. And and it's interesting some of the things you said, because sometimes, you know, I can see in my children the young I've got twins who are who are four, and you know, you can't do that job, Juliet, because you're a girl, or you know, that's a boy's job. It's you know, and it's it's scary because again, you know, I don't know where it's coming from. What conversations, what role models do we need to give our boys? And do we need to be starting with those role models sooner? Yes, I do think so. One of the things that I really like about what we are doing with the video hub of inspiring girls is that boys can watch that too and, and they can see all of these amazing women. And by the way, if you happen to have boys and they are around the, the adolescent years, I think that that video hub that we have with lots of women in different professions is really interesting in terms of careers advice and, <laughs> and, and trying to understand the jobs that that are there. I think that definitely the more that that um, boys look at female role models, the, the more we will change the current the current perception. It's, it's quite interesting when we when we ask girls about who is your top top role model uh, in terms of women, the, the name that we tend to get is Beyonce. And then a lot of their mothers, a little bit of their grandmothers, uh, but when you ask um, boys about who is your female role model, a lot of, I don't know whether your female role model, a female role model, <laughs> they, they, they tend to come up with Michelle Obama very quickly. So, um, so there is obviously a different perception as to what makes a, a good role model, depending on your gender. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, one last question. So my 10 year old daughter, um, this is this is a question for her because she knew that I was talking to you. So she wanted me to put a question in for her. She wants to be a vet, possibly also an actress. But the other day she said to me that she wants to be a feminist because she was inspired in school by the stories of the suffragettes. Uh, we've obviously come a long way since fighting for the right to vote. Um, do you think that there will still be a need for my trailblazing feminist daughter in 10, 20 years time? I do think so, actually. And it's something that um, worries me and, um, and frustrates me quite a bit, because I definitely, when I was the age that your daughter has, when I was 10, I, th I thought that I would not need to worry about these things when I would be the 52 years old that, that I am today. But I have seen progress being so slow. And, and, and something that I have seen over the last few years also is that we have peaks of momentum and we lose it. We let it be diluted. You know? And you know, the, the whole Me Too movement that, that put the spotlight not just on Me Too, but on the whole gender debate. And somehow we have lost some of it. You know? so, so in terms of making proper progress and, and trying to see now, how did you look at society as a 50-50 society? Now, why are we settling, for example, on the 30% in business? We are not 30%. I cannot look at a 10-year-old girl and tell her, you know, your objective, your target is 30%. <laughs> I, mean, I would be embarrassed to tell her that. You know? So there is a lot to be done already. And I would be very surprised if in 20 years' time um, that could be all sorted. Having said that, working a lot with girls all over the world as I have done over the last few years I am really encouraged by this new generation I think that um, they have a, a commitment and they look at the world as a global issue in terms of changing some of these debates and and they also have a realism that perhaps I didn't have when <laughs> when I was her age, so, so who knows? Hopefully they would be better than us at, at making proper progress. I hope so too. I think that's a really lovely note to leave it on. I could, I could talk for, for hours more, but thank you ever so much for your time and for joining, joining us today. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. And next time, I hope that you bring your daughter to ask the questions as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was Miriam Gonzalez Durantes talking to Claire Raisin. Lawyers Coach is brought to you by Client Talk and Hansard Coaching. If you've enjoyed this latest series, then please rate us on your podcast provider so others can find us. If you're a lawyer and would like to take part in Lawyers Coach, then please visit our website, lawyercoach.co.uk, for further details. You'll also find links to our previous episodes, including those from Series 1 and 2. And why not visit Lawyers Coach LinkedIn group so you can join the conversation there. If there are any topics you'd like us to discuss, then just get in touch. 